Go ahead. Uh-huh. The thing to is worse than they thought ever. Okay. Welcome back to the second worst marathon ever. I'm Big Eglovich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And we're happy to be with you once again. This is... That sounds like rain. I think that is rain. Do you hear that, folks? Now, we're still in a cabin in the woods. Ooh, cabin in the woods, oh... We're four college students on our way to a old abandoned cabin in the woods. And it's raining, it sounds like, atop us. Yeah, it doesn't. you can't see it out the windows, though, which is the weird part. I, maybe it's just wind. Maybe. Dude, that sounds so much like rain. But anyway, it, please ignore <laughs> the background. The music of the... Oh, now I can see it out the windows. Okay. It is looks it sh- like big drops. I should have put my windows up, I suppose. So oh, we'll keep yeah. this short. We're doing the uh, the Pixar rules of storytelling. Let's pause and put, close the windows on your car, because that can be bad, especially since we wanted to run, or to leave right after this. Okay. We'll be right back, folks. Are you still recording? Yeah, I'm just going to leave it on. Doodly doot, doodly doot, doodly doot. Okay, we're back. Uh, yeah, we just ran outside and rolled Rish's windows up to his car real quick so that we didn't have to, uh... Swim. <laughs> sit in a puddle the whole drive home. Um, okay, so yeah, we're still going through the rules of Pixar. Let me get up rule number 12. Discount the first thing that comes to mind. And the second, third, fourth, fifth... Get the obvious out of the way. Surprise yourself. Uh, sometimes I'll talk about the uh, creative writing teacher I had in college who... He would always say that the first thing that comes to your mind is something that you're stealing from a TV show or a book that you read. Uh, he would always say, never use the first thing that comes to your mind. And uh, I despised that guy. But here we have somebody... You didn't despise him because of that, though, did you? You just despised him because he was an a-hole, right? Well, he was an a-hole, but, he, you know, he, he was a my way or the highway kind of guy, and I guess he was trying to get us to change the way that we wrote. But he was never pleased with any of the stuff that I wrote to his design, you know, where I'd be like, okay, because his, well, his big thing was you can't know where you're going. You just write. You just let it organically flow out of you, and... Where it goes is where it goes, and that way it will be un- it will be uh, uniquely yours. It will- the word that he would hit all the time was idiosyncratic. He wanted everything to be idiosyncratic and not to be derivative of something that you'd seen and liked, et cetera, et cetera, which okay. I- flies in the face of that earlier. Yeah, this about. other war. How do you <laughs> let it flow from you but never take the first uh, option? But he would always criticize the things that I would hand in, and... I don't know that I've shared with you any of the stuff that I've written in that class. It was just always, I was never happy with it because it wasn't something I was passionate about, something I had thought about for a long, long time. And ooh, this just sounds good and stuff because that's what he didn't want you to do. And finally, at the end of the class, you know, we were supposed to write a large piece and there had been something that I had in the back of my mind that I'd wanted to write for a long, long time. And I just broke all of his rules. I didn't do any of the stuff that he said, and I just wrote from the heart. And it was the only one where it was just like, now you're getting it, underline, you know, kind of thing. And, <laughs> and so, you know, that's part of why I despised that guy. Um, and you said, what a bunch of a-holes. Well, that doesn't but, work. He wasn't a plural person. Yeah, he would say uh, that that's the, the stuff that first jumps into your mind is just stuff that you're copying. And, and for it to be... Really unusual, yeah. You have to dismiss and then dismiss and then, and uh, you know, come up with something else that you've never seen or what. I mean, it just the the pix- this particular Pixar rule sounds exhausting. <laughs> I yeah, I think it's not something that you have to do every time, but I think it is worth thinking about. Uh, it, like we were talking about in in an earlier rule where you want to do the thing that's unexpected. Uh, make the list of what wouldn't happen next. I believe that was rule number... Rule number nine! Right, but that was intended to get you out of a moment when you're stuck. Right. 
This just sounds like, do you have to do this all the time? This is a rule. It's like, no sleep, no rest for the wicked, boys. No something till No sleep till Brooklyn. Thank you. I don't know. I mean, I'm reminded. I wrote a story that you've never read that nobody's ever read. I'm sorry. I guess all of my you stories. You wrote a are lot story. of stories that are like that, actually. But it was called uh, Door Number Three, and there was a, a teenage girl who went over to the neighbor's house to babysit, and there were two doors in the hall to their house, and, and she put the boy to bed and came out, and there was a third door there that had never been there before. And then I stopped because I had no idea what could be behind that door. And I was like, oh, shoot, what, what, what do I do? And so you probably know what I did. I sat down and I said, I'm going to come up with 20 things that could be behind that door. And so I just made this huge list. It ended up probably being like 31 things, 32 things. And then that, you did a whole marathon of podcasts about each one of those things. It was 22. That was the third worst marathon ever. You, look it up. <laughs> and uh, maybe that's following that. That rule, you know, I made this big list of things that it could be, and I dismissed the first dozen or whatever, but I was never very pleased with what I picked. And I always thought, you know, well, if I'd had, if I'd known from the very beginning what was going to be behind that door, that would have been a good story. So, and that, which goes back to an earlier rule where we talked about the ending. No, this is the story you've, I think you've told me about this story before where you've, say that you you copped out and never told people what was behind the door, right? Ultimately, yeah, that's what I decided. But, but I, I felt like I had to know okay. what it was, even if you don't reveal to the reader what was behind the door, because I was never very pleased with what I came up with. And so I had, you know, the parents come home. Turned out it was a patio set and a, and a new barbecue was what was behind that door. And she picked it and it actually turned out good for her. I would see that. I wish you had been around in the writing process. There, she opens that's... it up. It's a brand new car. She's like, oh. Do, 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 yes. We'll be right back after these. Drew messages. Carey walks out with his really long microphone with the little tiny bulb at the end of it that they always use on uh, Price is Right. That creepy Bob Barker microphone. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think that's kind of what she's she's saying. I don't think it's a do this for every single thing that you do, but I'm sure for big plot points or big events that happen, it's better to do that. In my story that I'm percolating in my head and not writing like I should, in the gauntlet, the gauntlet compels the people who have it to go out and do good. And it basically kind of leads them by the nose to do these things. And so the people who get the gauntlet wind up in the midst of some kind of crime or some kind of problem going on. And I thought about that. And I even actually went on Facebook at one point and asked people, hey, is it okay for someone like me to... Am I, am I being insensitive or something by having my character foil a rape in progress or something like that. And uh, one of the people that commented suggested, well, you know, there's lots of other crimes and lots of other uh, reasons that people could be beating on somebody else that your character could step in on and foil. Um, you know, maybe you should make a list and discount one through five. I mean, they didn't say that, but that's basically what they were suggesting. And I thought that was a really good idea. And I've kind of come up with some other ideas for the crimes that they'll step into, which I think makes them more interesting. Oh, so, well, certainly, because the, the, the go-to is it's always a woman who's about to be raped or it's somebody getting mugged. It's one of those two things right. all the time. And then, I mean, it's just been done a million times. And if you can come up with something different, just suddenly the situation becomes more interesting. Right. And I mean, it, it serves the same purpose of foiling <clears throat> a crime or something terrible that's about to happen. But... Yeah, I even had a plan to turn people's expectations of what the crime will be on its head for the character itself, too. You know, she'll step in and rescue who she thinks is the person that's being hurt or whatever. And when it turns out that that person's actually the one that's doing the crime and the other person is the one that was uh, the victim. But assuming, without really using her observations or whatever, just 
taking the societal norms, assuming that's what's going on. Yeah, she does what she does and then realizes later, oh, geez, I think I've just rescued the criminal from the crime. Maybe I just gave away an, a fun part of my book when it finally comes out. But anyways, I, I think that's uh, definitely a worthwhile thing. Obviously, it's not something you have to do so that it's exhausting. Or maybe not obviously, but I think it doesn't need to be that. Um, well, can we come up with a Pixar example where you feel like, okay, that's probably what they did is come up with a big list and then it crossed okay. off the first five. Here's an example that I think might be that. Dory and Marlin are swimming along, arguing with each other, when suddenly, Dum! Hello? What's a couple of bites like you doing out on a night like this? A big shark is waiting for them. Obviously, the shark is going to try and eat them, right? But no, instead, the shark is a part of a group of sharks that are trying to change the perception of sharks as mindless eating machines. They have a Fish Eaters Anonymous kind of a group that they're bringing a friend along to, and that's what Dory and Marlin wind up in the middle of. I would say that's probably not the first idea they came up with. Well, I'll see, ultimately, Bruce does try and eat them. Yeah. So... They do have the, the expected thing happen after a, a series of comedic opposite things happening. And that sort of thing is pretty great where that they said, okay, so the shark tries to eat them. And it's like, oh, well, what if, no, what if the shark tries not to eat them? Yeah. That's the, what is the opposite? What shouldn't happen? Like we talked about in the earlier rule. The shark tries to not eat them is obviously what shouldn't happen, but they went with it. And I think, yeah, this might be one of those uh, examples. I mean, that's a, a, the first one that comes to my mind. I don't know what uh, like other that's... ones that you can think of, but um, that seems like a good example. So what do you think? End of the show? I think so. Yeah. All right. We made it through the start of the rain and the end of the rain in this one. Yeah, episode. it's quieted down. Now we can uh, go load our stuff into the car because... Uh, all this uh, recording equipment won't get soaked on its way out. So that's probably a good thing. All right, folks. We may record some of these while we're in the car as well. But uh, we're going to say this is the end of the rules in the cabin in the woods. Ooh. We'll see you next time. And we'll be back tomorrow from a different locale with more rules in the Pixar storytelling thing. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Tip your waitresses, folks. With more of the second worst marathon ever, everybody. See you later. At the Steef Audio Fiction Magazine, we pay our authors. So if you love good fiction and want to see it continue, please donate. That Gets My Goat is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it.